Recording has started. Okay. So thank you everyone. Welcome to the Division of Adult Education monthly webinar for March. Um, I will have several announcements, which will, I will try to get through very quickly so that we have as much time as possible for the panelists who will be discussing what makes an effective professional learning community or PLC. Um, so first of all, um, welcome to Tiffany Velez. And I'm sorry, I don't have the accent mark on that. Sorry about that, Tiffany. Um, I did ask Tiffany to uh, be willing to put herself on camera today. So Tiffany joined us on March 11th, correct? Um, as our newest advisor, she is uh, taking the position that Mary Kay Peters uh, left almost two years ago, so we're very happy to have Tiffany joining us. Uh, she has been an educator, author, and higher education administrator since 2010. Most recently, she was a professor of English and ESL at Lehigh Carbon Community College and an instructor in their adult education program. She will be doing the high school equivalency administ office administrator work uh, and will be an advisor for some agencies. Uh, the six agencies she will be working with are listed on the slide, and Tiffany and the advisors will um, work over the next uh, month or so to make that transition. So, um, Tiffany, did you want to say anything or just wave at everybody? I'll just wave. <laughs> okay. I think you said it all. That was good. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, Tiffany. Thank you. Um, oops. There we go. Okay. Um, ESL assessments. So at the kickoff last summer, we mentioned that Octa uh, has approved new ESL assessments and that the current ESL assessments would not be accepted after the 23-24 uh, program year, after this program year, and that we would use this program year as a transition year. Um, however, due to issues with some of the assessment vendors getting the necessary resources to states in a timely manner, Octay has extended the sunset period for the current ESL assessments through June 30th, 2025. So therefore we are going to, we are Pennsylvania, we are also going to extend approval of these current assessments through June 30th, 2025. So that means that you can continue to use these four assessments, which are the ESL assessments that we have approved in Pennsylvania. You can use those for the rest of this year and for next year. So I know that there had been a lot of concern about, you know, when were we going to, um, you know, get things into eData, which we're, we're still working on so that hopefully everything will be ready for the new program year. But I know people were concerned about students coming in now and, you know, doing pre-tests with assessments that we thought were going to expire. They are not going to expire June 30th, 2024. They will, ex you have another year to use them. Uh, and we we did talk to the, the vendors. Um, Christine was at COAB and, and spoke to uh, Cal. And Cal had said that they were going to stop supporting the best assessments as of June 30th. Uh, but they will continue to support it through 20, June 30th, 2025, due to the extension that Octay has put in place. Um, this is just a reminder. I, I sent an email out about a save the date for the 24-25 uh, kickoff. Uh, I sent the email on March 8th. If you didn't see it, that's when it was dated. Um, it will be June 30th to August 2nd at the Patan in Harrisburg. The program contact, program administrator should attend. Please let your advisor know if you are not able to attend any of those dates. Um, we will use that information to help us determine what we will cover on which dates. Uh, we strongly encourage subgrantee program administrators to attend the kickoff, and we may ask other staff to attend depending on the content of the kickoff. 
the advisors are going to send out a survey to you to uh, to the program contacts to get your input on the content of the kickoff, which we will use together with the evaluations from last year's kickoff uh, to plan the content. A couple of fiscal items, uh, the third quarter, the fiscal reports for the third quarter are due April 12th. Um, those are the reconciliation of cash on hand report that is submitted through FAI and the division quarterly expenditure reports that you send into your advisor. Uh, please remember that Comptroller's office suspends payments on your grants if you submit the reconciliation of cash on hand report late. Um, that is not that's not under our purview. That is the con the controller's office. And so please make sure you or your fiscal person get that in on time. Otherwise, payments are suspended until you get it in. Um, there were some questions around the incentive funds. Uh, the, in the incentive funds, unfortunately, you will not be getting as a lump sum payment. They're just added to the state funding portion of your 064 grant or of the 054 grant. Um, but I believe there's a way in doing the reconciliation of cash on hand report. If you've already expended a portion of your incentive funds in anticipation of receiving them, I believe you can put include those in your actual expenditures uh, for this third quarter, which should hopefully um, get some of those funds to you in April. Otherwise, uh, we are able to request advanced payments on your uh, grants after you submit that reconciliation of cash on hand report in April. This slide is for those of you who provide corrections education. I believe your advisors have already um, spoken to many of you about this. Um, you know, we have requested for many years now that you collect the, it's called an SID number uh, for individuals who are being served in corrections education. So any of you who are listening who do not provide services in a correctional facility, this doesn't apply to you. Um, we understand that some inmates don't have SID numbers, but we need you to get SID numbers for the students who do have them along with the release date. Um, up until now, we haven't really pushed for that much because we didn't have uh, a formal way to do a data match using those, uh, using that data um, for our federal reporting requirement around rates of recidivism. However, we do now have a way to do a data match for recidivism. And in order to do that, we need SID numbers and release dates. Uh, so moving forward, please do everything you can to get that data and get it into eData so that we can use it for federal reporting. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who has completed the evaluation of division communications. Uh, it is still open if you haven't completed it. Um, I've been reviewing the results over the last couple of weeks, and you know it's it's been very very helpful. Some very useful feedback to us, um, and has got me thinking about how to to do things moving forward. So if you haven't completed it and you have thoughts, please go ahead and do that. Um, and I will now turn it over to uh, Mary and the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, we will begin our panel discussion around what makes an effective professional learning community or in our acronyms PLC. So I do want to welcome all of the panelists um, that serve as IHPDSs at their agencies. And I just want to double check, Alexis Smith, are you here? Just want to check. Okay, um, and hopefully Alexis can join us. Um, so we have Alexis Smith from Beyond Literacy, Josh Rutledge from Lincoln IU 12, Holly Reagan from Marywood University, and Kristen Mingle from Reading Area Community College or RAC for our acronyms. 
Um, and so we are going to get started with our questions. Amanda, can you advance the slide, please? Thank you. Um, and so for the panelists, if you can keep your responses to maybe um, three to five minutes, that would be great. Um, and to um, everyone else, we will make time for questions. So feel free um, to place your questions in the chat. Um, and for my panelists, I'll do like a round robin. Um, so all of you will have the opportunity to provide your responses. So for the first question, um, what do you use to determine the basis of discussions for the PLCs? Um, how often do you and your colleagues meet? And is it in person or remotely? Um, so I will start with Holly from Marywood. Hello. Um, for the big picture planning to determine a topic for the plan year, I'll use uh, the data reports, the pit discussions, um, input from staff, uh, which is either received through informal discussions or when I survey them regarding their PD um, needs. Uh, during the actual PLC, I'll use a variety of materials such as articles, videos, podcasts to guide our discussions. And I'll often have the PLC participants bring in their job embedded quote product or assignment and we'll base a discussion or a peer review off of that. Um, in terms of frequency of our PLCs, it does differ. And I did this mostly because of the 2% PD requirement. So for example, this year we have three different cohorts which were determined by agency role and also um, whether they're full-time or part-time. So for example, our instructors are all part-time. So they only have about two to three PLCs a year. And then on the flip side, our student-facing non-instructor staff consists of a couple of full-time employees, um, along with staff who work many more hours than the part-time instructors. And so therefore, they do more PD hours throughout the year. So I might schedule five to six PLCs with them. Um, all of our almost all of our PLCs are in person. Um, and this is on purpose. I polled the staff and about two thirds of them said that they prefer face-to-face -face, and a third of them said that they like Zoom and face-to-face -face equally. No one said that they prefer Zoom only. So I do the in-person for that reason. Um, however, with that being said, we have done them in the past um, remotely, especially during COVID. So we are capable of moving to a remote PLC if there's a weather event or if there's a sickness. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate your answer. Um, Kristen, do you mind chiming in? Yes, hi. Uh, so I think I use a lot of the same things that Holly mentioned. Um, I and basically our PIPD plan, the the program improvement professional development plan, um, is what guides um, what we do in our PLCs. So we do have um, a majority part time instructors and then three full time instructors in our program. So um, use so this year we've been focusing on lesson planning. So ahead of time, I scheduled out the PLC meetings um, because it. I did it with the in-service, um, so we, they'd get some training. So I, you know, we we have four scheduled this year. We've have three already. We have one more coming up in April, um, and so uh, did you, so the first one we we did in person. I do it as, you know, a dinner potluck dinner. Um, we have a sub grantee uh, literacy council of Reading Berks, um, so we all come together. Um, you know, for a dinner and our first in-service uh, meeting uh, together. Um, we did have a Teams option there for those instructors um, who couldn't make it. Um, and trying to, I do it Monday evenings, which is, you know, it seems to catch, you know, as many of the part-timers um, as well as our full-time instructors. The subsequent meetings um, have been Teams. Um, uh, I think uh, hearing feedback, I hear that, they do like in person, um, but we just went to teams because, 
it seemed like that might be the best platform to try to get as everybody in, you know, in the meeting as possible. Um, this year, I did schedule some subject area, uh, subject expert, um, matter experts um, that help talk about digital literacy, transferable skills, and CCRS and ELPS. Um, so that the team's option was helpful for them because they're kind of they're all over the state. So um, though I did have people come out, they drove out. I think Sarah Cole was our prolo um, interim, and she came all the way from Pittsburgh back in October for the in-person. So that was great. And Chuck Klinger came out. Um, so that was um, really good. Um, I'm trying to think what else were. So I've done some informal feedback. Um, I, I heard recently in our February one, I did more of a formal uh, Google form and they did say they want more time in their PLC. So that um, for our last one, I'm going to make sure that is more just working in their PLCs. Um, I think that covers everything. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Josh, would you like to share? Hello. Yeah, so we as well really use the PIPD plan as kind of the, the guide for what we're going to do in the meetings and what we're going to discuss. And of course, PIPD PID, PID plan comes basically from the data and from, from the pit. So it's kind of all supports each other. Um, I also do take into consideration anything that, that teachers themselves think is important and want to add to the discussion. We meet monthly, so we, we meet for a two hour meeting every month. And we had always done them in person really up in, until COVID. And then once we came to COVID, of course, we, we did them on Zoom as a necessity. And what we found out was that we, we benefited from that because in the past, because we our agency is so geographically large, it was very difficult to get people together. Uh, without making people drive a very, very long distance. So the idea that we could have every single teacher on the same meeting, people really liked that. They liked interacting with each other, having that time to talk about their craft and, and really get into the being in a group of teachers. So we, we have just continued to do that. And I think we can still have very, very effective uh, PLC meetings that have the feel of an in-person meeting, even though we're not in person. So that's kind of what we've been, been doing. And it, I think it's working well for, for IU-12. Excellent, thank you so much. And Alexis, could you provide a response to question one? And good morning. <laughs> good morning, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, I'm very glad to be invited. Yeah, I'm Alexis Smith from Beyond Literacy in Philadelphia. And um, so to, we largely do go off of our PIPD plans, um, but you know, before developing the PIPD plan, we actually consult with all of the instructors as well as looking at our data and um, working with our consultant. So, um, you know, we uh, talk with our instructors to kind of, um, you know, get their feedback from the PLCs of the previous program year and see like what areas uh, they might want to work on, um, what kind of emphasis they'd like to see in the coming program year. And we use that to inform our PIPD plan. Um, and, you know, we try to follow the plan relatively closely, but we find that sometimes um, it is necessary to be flexible, necessary to... Um, you just went on mute, Alexis. You just went back on mute. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we find it, thank you. We find it is necessary. We try to follow the PIPD plan rather closely, but we do find it's sometimes necessary to adjust the sequence a little bit um, or, um, you know, slightly adjust um, what outcomes we're able to uh, get from the specific meetings. Um, in terms of the uh, length of our meetings, whether they're in person or remote, we are meeting um, monthly for two hours. And, um, 
we're primarily focusing on uh, objectives as stated in the PIPD plan, but we do have an additional component as well, which is um, we have um, small kind of, uh, we call them like our um, mentorship groups, but they're just like uh, small breakout groups that we do at the end of each PLC meeting where um, basically we break uh, instructors out based on um, their subject area and we just kind of provide a little bit of time for open discussion and check-ins about uh, maybe you know questions that people have situations people have encountered um what would you do if <laughs> kinds of things um and that's something that um our instructors have um you know really utilized and um, really appreciated just in this last uh, program year, because that's a new addition for us. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you all <laughs> for your thorough responses to question one. Um, Amanda, could you advance to the next slide? Great, thank you. So what strategies, structures, or frameworks are used during the PLCs to maximize participation and feedback from the instructors? What has worked or is working well? Um, and I am going to start with Kristen. Okay, yes. Uh, so I, I think for the, main, the, the way I approach it is, um, organization, um, just trying to be very organized. I realized I stepped into this role halfway in uh, a couple of years ago for, so I was sort of taking on the PIPD planned that was already planned. And so the next year I was like, okay, able to, you know, plan it and then realize, okay, what I need to do is be, you know, be more organized up front with the instructors to let them know um, at that very first in-service, I provide all the dates for the PLC meetings because we have specified ones that we meet on. So they had them. I sent them, you know, invites, you know, after that meeting to say, here, put them on your calendar so that you have them. Um, so organization, I usually have an agenda, um, trying to make it very clear what our plan is, what we're working on for the year. Um, and then when we have each meeting, I, again, just do a, an agenda you know, say this is this is the topic we're working on. Here's what the PLC needs to work on after the training. Um, and then there's usually a follow up, you know, with, with us this year, it's lesson planning. So with your PLC lesson plan is due on this date. And I kind of put all that forward ahead of time to them. Um, <clears throat> I guess that goes into like setting the expectations of, you know, what we're working on, you know, what we worked on last time, what we're working on now. Um, and, you know, I ask for feedback, like first it was informally. And then, like I said, mentioned before, I did an informal, I said a more formal um, after the last February one to get some feedback. I said, before you leave, you've got to fill this out. Um, and then it, that was helpful to read through that um, and hear how they found that particular training. Um, so I think all those really help and guide the PLCs to be productive, to know what they need to do um, in the session um, and then afterwards, and then to prepare for the next um, in-service PLC meeting. Excellent. Thank you. Josh, could you share? So we have a few strategies that really are helpful for our PLCs. I think really the critical friend model is, is kind of a core of what we do that we we really want the teachers to feel free to give their opinions if they're looking at a lesson if they're evaluating someone else's lesson to be able to to actually <laughs> as a professional talk about what they think about the material and, and no one's going to be offended and i think we've worked really hard to kind of create the culture where no one is going to be personally offended we we know we're talking of, about improving our instruction and working together as teachers. So I think we really strive to focus on that and, and just the whole job embedded aspect of this, that I'm never having a meeting where I'm talking at them or lecturing. We are always have these meetings set up as basically workshops, collaborative sessions mm -hmm. where we are mm -hmm. working together as a team and everyone's putting their ideas out there 
and I'm kind of like trying to draw on the expertise that the teachers have. Like that's the valuable resource we have is that we have these incredible teachers who know mm -hmm. so much and they have different kinds of expertise. And so I, I love the fact that we have all of our teachers together now. So we've got the ESL, we've got the GED and they each bring something uh, special to, to the group. So that's really been a big focus on that. Uh, and I also think just the idea that we set goals and we're going we're gonna to create lessons and we're going to teach lessons and, and sort of encouraging staff to be a part of that and volunteer. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just think we have a, a good culture. And, and, and I think I, I give a lot of credit to, to the staff for realizing that the PLC meeting doesn't have to be something that you dread. It could be something that you look forward mm -hmm. to and it can be enjoyable. <laughs> very very productive at, at the same time and and i think to kind of kick that off i always like to try to model what i think are are good mm -hmm. practices so i'll be the the guinea pig i'll be the the first person to come in with a new lesson and i'll encourage them okay be as critical as you need to be because we're trying to improve the lesson for the benefit of the students and they, they see that i can take that kind of conversation and that that helps them uh feel less wary about if they bring in a lesson next month that it's, it, we're not insulting them or anything to suggest changes and revisions. So, so yeah, that's kind of what we, we do, kind of to the sort of the team building aspect of the PLC. Excellent. Thank you so much. Alexis? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to um, echo some of the things that Josh said for sure. Um, you know, building a sort of a collaborative environment where everybody is sharing their own expertise and we're sort of drawing on that pool of resources that we have among our instructors. That's the real goal that we have. Um, in terms of um, structures and frameworks, um, so our PLCs are conducted a little bit differently in that we um, do separate PLCs for our um, ESL and ABASE instructors. So there's a little bit more uh, focus within those two subgroups. Um, and you know, one of the structures that we use uh, just to make sure that you know people have um you know have things to share are ready to work together on the topic at hand is um we do uh clear goal setting for the next meeting at the end of each plc meeting so we sort of articulate if any homework needs to be done um you know any work outside of the meetings and um you know then a reminder is sent out a few days before or a week before the upcoming PLC meeting, just kind of refreshing people on um, uh, what had been our goals, what, um, you know, what is the, the topic that we're going to be working on together. And so, you know, people aren't taken by surprise. They've got that mm -hmm. actively in mind. And um, I would say something that, um, you know, definitely does work well is the modeling. That's something where I'm also very happy to be a guinea pig. And, <laughs> um, you know, I know that uh, Michael and Mitch on the ESL side do a whole lot of modeling as well. Um, now, one of the things that um, I've found is that, you know, people are um, usually pretty happy to take part in a group discussion where we've got kind of multiple people contributing and sharing their experiences. But if it feels like kind of one person is being put on the spot in the PLC, like, you know, you're gonna um, present this since then everybody else is going to give their feedback. Um, that's something where we've actually had a little bit, um, a little bit less success ourselves. So we um, mm -hmm. typically when it's not me uh, presenting, we'll have kind of like multiple people presenting, you know, their own approach to the topic at hand rather than just one mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Holly? Uh, yes, um, you know, I don't want to repeat what my colleagues just said, but we do a lot of the similar things that they mentioned. Um, I will say in terms of structure, I 
almost always provide a pre PLC assignment for staff to do at home. Um, and my reason for that is that we can start the discussion right away during the PLC, um, but that it also allows me to fit in as much content as I can while keeping the PLC to a reasonable time limit. Um, and then I think also for the staff and the instructors, it provides like a background knowledge for what's going to be presented at the next PLC or what the discussion will be about. And it just gives them kind of a preview of, what, of the topic. Um, and it's good for me because they have to submit that form and then I can keep track of who's done it. I can see comments. So it's very helpful for me as, as an administrator. Um, at the actual PLC, you know, I just really try to do a variety of uh, techniques and methods and resources. Um, you know, just as a teacher, I don't want to, I don't want, as a teacher, I don't want students to be bored. So at the PLCs, <laughs> I don't want our staff to be bored. So I really, really try to just do a variety of uh, methods, whether it's videos, readings, um, demonstrations, peer demonstrations, peer reviews. Um, and then another thing, you know, we, this year, I we're doing several different cohorts, but one of them is based on trauma-informed practices. Mm. Um, so in terms of structure, I had all of the participants um, who were enroll into the PD portal course, and I used that as a foundation, and then subsequent PLCs delved deeper into the topic and addressed specific trauma-related issues that were specific to our agency. Um, feedback, I always, you know, do some type of survey that I want everyone to complete. Um, this helps me, you know, check if things um, have been learned, but it also helps me plan. Um, so all of that seems to be working well. I think creating the different cohorts really helped with uh, staff buy-in. Uh, I, you know, it really gave the staff a voice and, you know, I, I, by asking them, what do they want to do? What matters to them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and another thing that worked well, and, and this is to the credit of our director, Melinda, um, you know, she values the PD is that even though we did have these different cohorts, we always invited everyone to them. So if it was your specific cohort, it was mandatory, but then if it wasn't your cohort, we invited you as an optional. And a lot of them would come, even though it wasn't required or it wasn't part of their 2% PD. So I think mm -hmm. that worked really well. Um, and another PLC cohort that I had was for a new hire. So she, and um, it involved the new staff induction process. And, and unlike other PLCs, this was mostly done remotely um, in the form of Google form assignments. That worked out really well because it spread the requirements out throughout 12 months instead of overwhelming a new teacher and giving them everything, all the requirements of that new staff induction process, it allowed them to spread it out um, and, you know, kind of enter the program at a, at a better pace than having to do everything all at once. Thank you so much. I'm really, truly enjoying all of your responses and all of the sharing and feedback that you are providing to the field. Um, I once was an IHPDS, so it's amazing um, how much the craft has evolved. Um, and thank you so much for sharing. One of the things you really, I think all of you pointed out was modeling. I think that is extremely important as opposed to, um, you know, the IHPDS always taking the lead, always thinking of what um, PD will work best. You are modeling, you're allowing for fee feedback from the instructors, you are including them in the um, you know, program objectives and what can make programming better. So thank you so much for your work that you are doing with the instructors as well as other staff. Um, and I'm sure um, others on this meeting do appreciate um, some of the things that you have been sharing thus far. Um, and so we're going to move on to our final question. And I think all of you have spoke to this um, briefly, um, but what has been the most successful outcome of the PLCs? Um, and in um, contrast, what has been the most challenging? Um, so I'm going to start with um, Alexis.
I'd say that the most successful outcome of our PLCs has been just an increased sense of community among instructors. Um, you know, rather than kind of, you know, this, some of the specific uh, goals that we've been working towards, which have been great as well. We're doing a lot of focus on digital literacy ourselves. Um, you know, we've definitely observed outcomes in terms of um, people being able to support their learners a little bit more with digital skills, people, um, instructors being a little bit more confident with their own skills. But I would say um, beyond that, the most successful outcome is just um, people feeling a little bit of togetherness, a little bit of um, willingness to go to one another for help, to share resources with one another, um, and to um, you know really kind of approach their teaching as a collaborative effort. Um, one issue is, and this might be true um, of other organizations, especially ones that are a little maybe on the larger side, um, it can be easy to get a little bit siloed when, um, <laughs> you know, you are um, working remotely in particular, or if part of your work is remote, um, when you're teaching, you know, a specific subject, you're not um, always encountering people who might do other work or might be working with other programs. Um, you know, the community schools people might not necessarily know what um, the mainline ABASC people are doing, what the mainline ESL people are doing. Um, so, you know, bringing people together and creating that shared sense of community, I think, has been a really important function of the PLCs. And I would say something that has really helped to build that is the um, mentorship groups that we've established as part of the PLC meetings, where people, um, they just have a really open forum to share with one another, ask questions and um, offer their own guidance, their own experiences. And, um, you know, they can they can even just be um, kind of brainstorming sessions for, you know, how could we possibly um, approach this new situation that an instructor has encountered in their classroom? Um, I think that the most challenging thing for us has actually been having, um, you know, helping people have the confidence to mm -hmm. um, really sort of present um, in the context of a PLC. We have some instructors who have been very happy to, um, you know, prepare and share um, one of their techniques, something that they're proud of, and then receive feedback on it. There's a lot of instructors who have not been comfortable doing that. Um, so that's something that we've been working on, trying to um, sort of create a dynamic where that's normal, expected, and, um, you know, also something that doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like a challenge. It doesn't feel like an undue amount of extra work and um, feels really accessible for folks. So I think that, that um, that's something where I'm looking to learn from others about how to create that kind of environment in our PLCs. Um, and as I said, people do, um, do a lot of sharing in our groups, but it's typically um, in the context of, you know, we'll have sort of like a, a discussion circle where each person will sort of share, okay, this is, um, this is what I do in my classroom, this is what I do in my classroom, and, you know, in that kind of context, people are a lot more comfortable with um, participating and sharing out their own approaches. Um, so yeah, those are those are our biggest successes and challenges, I think. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go to Josh next. If I'm gonna echo uh, <laughs> what Alexis was saying, I, I, we have a lot of teachers who just don't see each other really on a on a, any kind of regular basis. 
And I think they just look forward to that time that they know, okay, third Friday of every month, they're going to be actually talking to the teacher and they talk to each other. And we, we have all of these things that we accomplish throughout the year. We create these lessons, we pilot lessons, we do all of these things. But I, I think sometimes the teachers just benefit from getting better at their craft because they get to talk to each other about those mm -hmm. just everyday things. And mm -hmm. because, yeah, a lot of them are might be a little bit isolated on, in their daily practice. And I think they enjoy that. And then I like the fact that when we do create things, when we do create lessons, when we do, we create some kind of like a, like a template for observation or something like that, it was literally made by several teachers. So like almost every single teacher mm -hmm. in our program had a hand in creating that lesson and had a hand in how it was revised. So I just think that's kind of cool. It's never just the work of, of one teacher. Uh, I also like the fact that kind of what we do encourages collaboration. So in, instead of just saying, okay, this one person, you're gonna have to go do the lesson, maybe two of them will, will work on it together. And that kind of creates a bond. The teachers get to know each other, they get to benefit from each other. And then in terms of challenges or things that have been difficult, I, I think really just time. We, we just mm -hmm. don't have enough PD time to do this kind of work maybe as, as often as we could where we could do more lessons in a year. But other than that, I, I think it's been more successes than challenges. Excellent. Thank you so much. Holly? Uh, yes. Um, I would say the most successful outcome is the is um, the fact that staff have expressed how helpful the PLCs have been this year. They seem to be very engaged by the topics. Um, so I, I know that they find it relevant. Um, you know, we're making changes to our policies and procedures based on what's being learned. So I think that's a success. Um, and I think ultimately the fact that we have instructors choosing to come to an optional PLC is a successful outcome. You know, they of course have their required PLCs, but then taking the time to come to an optional one, I count that as a success. Um, I'd say as a challenge, um, you know, we have a, a group of staff members who have been with the agency for a long time. So a challenge for me is just having to, you know, is finding new relevant informa information for each plan year. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. And then um, I think another challenge is, you know, a challenge for any person who develops professional development across any industry. And that's just, you know, asking the instructors or the staff to make real change and then, you know, mm -hmm. possibly switching mm -hmm. to a different focus the following year. Um, so, you know, that can affect buy-in among staff. So that's always a challenge for me. Um, and then I think just administratively, you know, the 2% the number requirement differs among all staff. So that's mm -hmm. a challenge just administering that. And, you know, it requires that precise paperwork and organizational skills. And it, it requires me to be creative in my planning. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, Kristen? Yeah, I would echo a lot of what my colleagues have said. Um, for our program, as I was listening, um, it kind of echoed some of the same things. Um, I think the teachers really, like we had, like I said before, that isolation that my colleagues were talking about, you know, we have some at teach at night. And so just that value of coming together, I think they really appreciate that. That was the feedback that I received. They, we, we need, they, a lot of them said, we need more time in our PLCs. They really enjoy talking and connecting um, with other instructors. Um, so that's been very successful. Um, I would, I think we're, we've been doing, you know, in terms of the PIPD plan and sort of what I set out at the beginning of the year, it's always hard to sort of think through, okay, how is this going to look across the year and are we going to accomplish it? And I, I think it's been very successful that sort of the goals and objectives from the PIPD plan that I've put into our in-service and PLC meetings, we've been hitting those marks, which is um, very encouraging because that means they've bought into it. They're doing the work, they're um, talking um, and, you know, doing the assignments. Um, so they've been engaged. Um, 
uh, I've seen, it's nice to see like, uh, again, we separate our, our PLCs by ESL, um, ABE, and then Literacy Council is their own um, PLC. And then we have full-time instructors as part of a PLC. So, you know, seeing leaders kind of come up and just naturally kind of lead it. Um, last year, it was interesting. We had a PLC, I, you know, because I don't tell them who has to be the leader. So it's nice to see them take ownership of that. Mm -hmm. And one PLC last year, they rotated when they met, like leading the meeting, setting the goals for the next meeting, and what needed to be accomplished. Um, so that's, that's really encouraging to see. Um, and I guess the challenges I I'm just going to reiterate a lot of what my colleague said as well is, is the time and the PD time that's required. It's like, wow, we got to pack this in. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a lot of our other, our part-time instructors do have like full-time jobs and then they come and teach at night for us, you know, or, you know, whatever they work this job in, in, in addition to other things. And so trying to make it um, relevant to them um, mm -hmm. And within the time that we need, you know, that get this, get these things accomplished. Um, so, yeah, and, and just trying to find that time that's best for everybody um, to meet, um, given where, where they are in their other jobs or whatever else that they're doing. But, um, yeah, I think that sums it up for, for us. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of the panelists um, for your time, for sharing, um, providing some very valuable feedback, sharing your expertise and um, your different ways of engaging, you know, instructors and other staff and much needed, you know, professional development and making sure you're enriching um, their skills and their roles um, as part of um, your agency's programs. And so for this slide here, we do have the panelists' um, contact information. Panelists, feel free if you would like to just drop your email in the chat, but it is here. Um, and also the recording will be available as well as the slides will be available on the PA Adult Resources. But if the panelists feel okay with dropping their um, email in the chat right now, that's fine as well. Um, and so we do have um, time for some questions, but I do want to check the chat really quickly. Um, so we do have a comment um, for Alexis. Um, I love the idea of the guided mentorship breakout discussions at the end of the PLC. Thank you for sharing. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Um, thanks for the sneak peek into a party we admins can't attend. <laughs> this is from Dawn. <laughs> You're all doing really great and valuable work. Um, Kristen, she dropped her email as well as Alexis. Um, so again, we do have some time for questions. If you want to drop a question in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, if you can't think of any questions, please reach out to the IHPDSs um, with any questions that you may have. Um, Amanda, I don't know if you want to chime in and share your thoughts about the presentation. I just want to say thank you to all four of our presenters and for the great work you're doing with the professional learning communities. It sounds like there's some really exciting work going on and um, I, I just I think it's uh, I think it's an example of how your colleagues working together can really uh, improve and program. So thank you very much. And there are a lot of thank yous in the chat. Um, so I am actually going to turn it back over. Amanda, did you want any last words for the field? Um. No, we just have the last slide is just a question mark. Um, <laughs> yep. I, don't, I don't know if anyone had any questions related to the items I addressed at the beginning. Uh, if you do, you can put them in the chat. Um, I can address them. Uh, if not, we can finish early. Thank you all. Yes, thank you all. Okay, seems like there's no questions in the chat. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Have a great day. Thanks so much, and you too. All right, you do the same. Thanks.